We're going to look at Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. So I'm going to teach you how you can argue against this passage without using dispensationalism. You can use dispensationalism in this one that applies to Jews, but I'm going to train you how you can do that uh, without getting into dispensationalism arguments. We're going to look at Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Uh, ain't that a nasty verse showing that water baptism is required for salvation? So that really seems like he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So that seems like you have to get water baptized for salvation. Now, is that what God bases it on? Does he require water baptism for a person to get saved? No, he doesn't require somebody to get baptized in water for salvation. This is absolutely wrong. Now, how we can deal with this argument? Now, this is the famous argument that a lot of independent Baptists will argue. What they will say is this. What, how they will argue is that a person who believes in Christ for salvation will obviously be expected to get baptized. That's how they're going to uh, argue. It's like, for example, I buy the ticket and get on the plane to reach San Francisco. So the main idea of that sentence was buying the ticket. It was natural to get on the plane. It's obviously expected to get on the plane after that. So that's a common argument independent fundamentalist Baptists will use. Now, Church of Christ, there's a couple of them who will debate. They will try to insist that that's not the case because otherwise, why would God, God include and get baptized? It's like and get on the plane. Getting on the plane is necessary to reach San Francisco even though that's obviously expected. So they're going to insist baptism is obviously expected, yes, but it's still required for salvation. Now, how you can argue is this. How you can argue is using the word and. So you can still stick to the argument, obviously expected. That's why it makes sense. As soon as a person believed on Christ for salvation, what happened? They immediately got baptized, right? You notice that in the Bible? Like Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch. What hinders me to get baptized? Well, obviously, you can get expected to get baptized if you get believe on Jesus first. So if you want to insist to, in that argument, you can use Acts 8 as one example, but also the phrase and. So you notice that word and? So we believe in literally arguing every word in the Bible, right? And means consequently expected. See that? So obviously, if you look at Acts 8, so you can use that as an example, it was consequently expected that the person, once he believed on Christ for salvation, consequently, it would be expected, he would get water baptized. You can use Acts 16 as well. As soon as a Philippian jailer believed on Christ for salvation, consequently, it was expected he and his family would get baptized, and they did. So the, you can argue and with the English dictionary. The second thing that you can do is this, because they might still be able to debate against that. So actually, this is the weakest argument, believe it or not. So I'm going to give you stronger and stronger ones. Second thing you can argue <coughs> is that look at the second uh, the first part he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved right if it's expected you have to believe and get baptized for salvation why didn't he say that in this part of the verse look but he that believeth not and is baptized not shall be damned did i read that right no but he that believeth not shall be damned Showing that what the author is pointing out right here is that the main idea had nothing to do with baptism. It was believing. If baptism was also definitely necessary, why didn't he add that part in the second part? But he that believeth and is baptized not shall be damned. It's believing. Why? The proof is the second part of the verse. So you'll notice that's what cults do, right? They will always quote partially the verse. They're not going to quote you the whole verse. We're Bible believers, right? You're going to look at the whole counsel of God, the whole verse. You're not going to just focus on half of it. 
That's why it makes sense. Damnation is based on believing. The first part, it was consequently expected. The saved person would get baptized. If any of you believed on Jesus Christ for salvation, I would expect you to get water baptized. And a lot of you wanted to do that immediately, right, when you got saved. So that's what it is. Now, it gets even stronger than that. We're going to look at the third part of the argument right here. The point is this. Main idea, how we know this is the main idea. So repeating point number two. But main idea based on repetition. That's extremely important. Now, remember that example I used about I buy the ticket and get on the plane to reach San Francisco? So you can use that for argument one. But if the cults argue, it doesn't change the fact that getting on the plane is absolutely required to reach San Francisco, then what you can do is this. Rather than giving one sentence, give a full paragraph of a sentence about the main idea of getting, uh, uh, buying a ticket to reach San Francisco, that that's the main idea. When you do that, it changes thinking. So some of you might have gotten confused. Let me explain a little bit more, okay? Let me say it this way. <clears throat> it is very important to buy the ticket. It does not matter how much money it costs because the ticket is necessary in order to meet our business partners in San Francisco. You must buy the ticket and get on the plane to reach San Francisco. But if you do not buy the ticket, then our business plans in San Francisco fail. So I am urging you to please buy the ticket. Now, what was the point if your boss told you that? Was it getting on the plane or was it buying the ticket? Buying the ticket, right? Now, you notice I mentioned get on the plane, but the person who keeps yakking on buy the ticket, buy the ticket, will naturally, obviously say get on the plane, but that's not the whole point. That's not the whole point. He just thought that is something naturally expected. So we, that still proves the main idea was buying the ticket, not getting on the plane. What's the point here? The point is that similar phrase that I use, that paragraph, is the same thing in your Bible. You might say, how so? Well, let's look at this. Mark 16. Look, start at verse 11. Verse 11. And, when, and they, when they had heard that he was alive and had seen of her, what was the issue? The main idea here. Believe not. That was the issue. Let's keep reading. Verse 13. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Now, obviously, their problem wasn't getting baptized. It was believing, right? <laughs> Do you think Jesus had a problem with them? You didn't get dunked in water. <laughs> oh, by the way, some of them already did get dunked in water by John the Baptist. So that wasn't the issue here. So let's keep reading right here. Verse 14, And afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and neglect of baptism. No, it's the unbelief and hardness of heart because they, what? Believe not and baptize not? No, because they believe not them which had seen him after he was risen. Now look at verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. See that? That was similar with the long paragraph that I mentioned here. You must buy the ticket and get on the plane to reach San Francisco. But if you do not buy the ticket, then our business plans in San Francisco fail. You see that? That wording was similar with this one at verse 16. And you, if you can obviously expect the main idea was buying the ticket after that, why can't you do that with the Bible? It shows they were picking one verse rather than reading the whole context of what the main idea was about. That's what cults do, see? Cults always do that. Uh, I didn't finish reading. Look at verse 17. And these signs shall follow them that what? Believe. Immediately after he quoted verse 16. It wasn't baptism. It's believing, believing, believing. Boom. So that's the third. That's the strongest argument. The strongest argument right here. By the way, we're not done. I'm going to give a fourth argument right here. All right? The fourth argument is this. You can also tell by the writing style of the author what he's talking about. Okay? Now, what do I mean by that? The author style, which is Mark, 
I'm going to show you something here. Okay, this is something you probably never noticed before when you read Mark 16 or the, the other parts of Mark. Did you ever notice the style writing of Mark? He uses and as something obviously expected, but that word and, it bears no necessity to the rest of the sentence. It wasn't really essential. Now you might say, oh no, I don't think so. Well, look at the, look at it right here. Mark 16, 2. And very early in the morning. Now that is obviously expected and has no necessity at all. Now you might say, oh no, it's necessary. No, because keep reading. They came unto the sepulcher at the what? Rising of the sun. See that? He already said the rising of the sun. But that when he uses and, he keeps using that as something that's naturally, obviously expected. That's normal. What you got to understand is this, is that in the Bible, the Lord, he teaches, yes, every doctrine as an importance, but that does not neglect the author's character and style that the Lord allowed to be in his holy word. That's something very humbling that God will use a flawed vessel like you despite of your character and personality and he will somehow use it mildly for his glory let alone inspire them as his words <laughs> oh wow right wow Solomon didn't God use his words as given by inspiration at Ecclesiastes even though all of that stuff in Ecclesiastes was yakking about his problems in life and complaining see that now let's keep reading right here, verse 4. And when, uh, notice right here, <coughs> and when they looked. Now that's something obviously expected and has no necessity at all. You might say, oh no it does. Well, look at this. When they looked, they what? Saw that the stone was rolled away. Look, it already said saw right after they looked, okay? Look how he keeps using and, 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 and. Look at verse 8, verse 8. And they went out quickly, right? Uh, and fled from the sepulcher. Now notice right here, and fled from the sepulcher is something that is obviously expected and has no necessity at all. Why? Because it already mentioned the first part, and they went out quickly. Okay, so since they went out quickly, it's obviously they fled, okay? Let's look at verse 10. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And wept is something obviously expected and has no necessity at all. You might say, no, it does. Well, he says they mourned already. See that? Notice how he uses and, 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 and as something that's obviously expected. But it's not. It bears no necessity to the rest of the text. In fact, you can see this. <laughs> By the way. Have you read Mark 16? I don't know if you noticed it. Did you read every single verse how he starts out with? Look at that right now. And, 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 and. Look at that. <laughs> By the way, you think that I'm done? You think that I'm done? Look at chapter 15. Let's start at verse 1. And. Verse 2. And. You see the beginning of every verse? And, 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 and. Did you see that starting from verse 1? Look at that. They ignore completely the author's style of writing. He always uses that. It's like me using the word all the time. Like uh, I would probably say, I forgot, but there are words I keep using repetitively that some people online will say, you're just saying this word repetitively, repetitively. But see, that's the style of the person's speech and writing. See that? You better, you people online better be thankful I didn't write the book of Mark. Otherwise, if you criticize me, then you're in trouble. <laughs> but anyways, point is this. The point is they completely ignored. I also want to add this. I'm just going to add this as a last argument. We won't turn there for time's sake. But the last argument is this. Mark's writing pattern, he that believeth, uh, he that believeth is saved, he that believeth not is damned. That kind of wording was not a coincidence from Mark, you got to understand. That kind of wording, he was, he was quoting similarly what all Christians said. If you believe, you're safe. If you don't believe, you're damned. Have you ever seen that writing pattern before? For example, Mark 16, 16, we saw that. But John 3, 18 is one example. John 3, 36 as another example. 1 John 5, 10 as another example. 
If you believe, you're saved. If you don't believe, you're damned. So since all Christians kept repeating that over and over again, don't you think Mark knew that was the main gist and main idea? That's what he was simply doing. That and part is just his style. He just adds that in because that's his style of writing. So these are five powerful arguments. So writing pattern. So look at the writing pattern with other Christians. The writing pattern is similar with other Christians. So that's why it's, in fact, uh, a lot of liberals use the Gospel of Mark as a copycat of what all the other apostles were doing. So you see right here, there's no doubt there was a writing pattern that's shared similarly with other Christians. They, even atheists and liberals know that.